Welcome everyone. It's really nice to see all of you. My name is Andrew Cohen. And I'm Shalab Roisman. Uh, and we're very pleased uh, to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Rehnquist Center uh, and the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law to the third installment of our National Constitutional Law Workshop uh, series. Uh, we're extremely pleased uh, today to welcome uh, Keith Whittington, who's going to talk to us uh, about impeachment. Uh, Keith will speak for roughly 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, I will keep the queue. Uh, you can get in line to ask a question simply by typing Q in uh, the group chat. Uh, we ask you to keep yourself, to limit yourself to one question, uh, but if you have a second question, feel free to get back uh, in the queue, and we're happy uh, to let you ask a second question if there is time. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Keith. Uh, great, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, this paper and, and these issues uh, more generally. Um, over the last few years, I've been uh, writing a fair amount about the uh, impeachment power and how to think about it uh, more broadly. Uh, this follows on uh, things I've been writing about uh, with the impeachment issues since uh, really my, my dissertation um, in the early 90s, uh, when somehow I fell, fell into thinking about impeachments. Um, and uh, one thing I've been advocating over the last uh, few years um, uh, on thinking about impeachments more generally is that we need to take a, a political orientation toward thinking about impeachments, um, uh, which includes that in part we need to recognize they are fundamentally discretionary. Um, there are choices that political actors make about how best to remedy uh, particular kinds of political problems they uh, have before them. Um, and they involve choices about whether remedy, whether impeachment is the best remedy uh, for the kind of problem uh, that they think uh, is confronting them. Um, one thing, though, that became very apparent um, over the course of the Trump impeachments and the debates surrounding uh, the Trump impeachments uh, generally um, is that as scholars, we haven't actually done, I think, a good enough job of really thinking through uh, when is impeachment justified in the context of abuse of power. Um, it is the consensus view among scholars uh, who have focused on the impeachment power over time uh, that abuse of power is impeachable um, and falls within the scope um, of the impeachment power. Um, but I think uh, quite reasonably, um, the defenders of President Trump um, uh, pointed to a problem uh, with this uh, possibility, which is um, that abuse of power might happen all the time. It's frequently the case that critics of administration think that a presidential administration particularly is uh, abusing um, the powers of its office in one way or another. Um, and so we need um, uh, some assessment of when, uh, when uh, critics are asserting that there's been abuse of power that we should then reach for the impeachment power in response. Um, the Trump administration uh, defenders uh, wanted to suggest that um, really there's, there's uh, no gap between the identification of abuse um, and the subsequent uh, uh, conclusion that you ought to impeach um, a sitting president, um, given how we talk about abuse of power and the impeachment power, uh, which they suggested that creates much too slippery of a slope. Impeachments become much too common, uh, much too partisan under those circumstances. Um, I do think as scholars, we have uh, dropped the ball a bit on this issue in that um, about as far as we've gotten about thinking about when um, abuse of power might be impeachable is to emphasize the idea that it has to be a, an important abuse of power, um, a grave abuse of power, a significant abuse of power uh, might be um, impeachable. Um, but again, I, that, and that helps to some degree, but I don't think it takes us very far in really thinking about uh, how to respond to this concern um, that you're opening the floodgates um, if you allow for abuse of power to be uh, impeachable more generally. So what this paper tries to do is to um, take up that question of when does abuse of power justify impeachment, and it does it um, by focusing on um, alternative remedies. Um, uh, why, under what circumstances does it make sense to think about other tools? Um, they're in the legislative toolbox to respond to um, uh, problems of abuse of power. And when does impeachment actually make the most sense and ought to be uh, the remedy that uh, legislators uh, reach uh, to um, when trying to address a particular problem? Um, of abuse. Um, so I won't talk about now, although I'm happy to come back and, and talk about it in questions um, about the extent to which um, abuse of power is impeachable and why we ought to think um, that abuses of power fall within the scope 
um, of the impeachment power more generally. Like I said, I think this is the mainstream position, but I do take some time um, in the paper to walk through uh, some of the justifications for uh, how we think about the impeachment power and why abuse of office um, uh, falls, um, falls within it. Um, but instead, I want to, at least um, in these opening remarks, just say a little more about um, uh, this problem of comparative uh, instruments available for addressing um, the problem of abuse and where impeachment uh, falls within uh, the set of uh, tools that um, Congress and really the American citizenry in more general uh, might have to um, relate uh, to uh, the abuse of power problem. I should note, though, that also in the paper, um, uh, I take note of the fact that um, we should think about impeachments being available not only in the context of abuse of power, um, but perhaps in a closely related context of violations of constitutional authority. Um, that is, we can imagine circumstances in which a government um, official um, violates the Constitution, um, uh, not simply abusing the Constitution. Here I'm thinking about the distinction being one of uh, circumstances in which you have exceeded the authority of your office um, or perhaps um, uh, cross some boundary of a specific rule that disallows uh, certain kinds of behavior to take place of which, um, so those might be instances of violations or excess or exceeding the power of the office. The, um, in contrast to abusive office, which is to say instances in which you are um, abuse, uh, taking an, uh, a step um, that is recognized as being within your lawful authority, um, and yet nonetheless, um, in this particular context, uh, viewed as being abusive. Um, the question of constitutional violations, we often don't think of as being particularly impeachable either. And I think that's obviously not because we don't think that you could impeach a president um, or any other government official um, uh, for uh, violating the constitution and taking actions that uh, violate somebody's constitutional rights or that exceed um, the powers um, of their office. Instead, though, we don't normally think about uh, impeaching um, officers when such uh, violations are asserted, um, or in fact, we even think that they've actually happened, uh, because we often turn to other tools that we think are actually more effective and more useful uh, for addressing uh, these problems of constitutional violations, uh, rather than use the impeachment power. And I think by analogy, we should be thinking in the same way um, when we're thinking about abuses of power more generally, but it's worth, I think, um, uh, being more self-conscious about the fact um, that this is true in the context of constitutional violations um, themselves. I think it'd be strange indeed if we came to the conclusion um, that constitutional violations uh, somehow uh, were outside the scope of the impeachment power or could not justify impeachment uh, simply because most of the time we choose not to use the impeachment power uh, to address those problems. Well, why don't we use the impeachment power in the context of constitutional violations? Well, one um, uh, obvious answer is that we frequently instead um, have turned to judicial review. Uh, this isn't necessarily what the founders imagined uh, that we would be doing. They thought of the of judicial review as being a relatively small part of the constitutional process. I don't think it was completely beyond their expectations uh, that they imagined something like judicial review, but something like our modern form of judicial review certainly is not what they were um, uh, readily anticipating. They thought an impeachment process would be a more prominent part um, of our constitutional system than it turned out to be. And increasingly over time, what we have turned to is the uh, process of using judicial review to deal with these potential constitutional violations rather than relying on legislatures. And there are good reasons why we've made that um, choice of what kind of instrument to use uh, when we uh, come across this particular kind of political problem. Uh, one is the judicial review turns out to be uh, generally fairly effective in the American context. Um, it turns out that presidents, for example, are generally willing um, to curb their behavior when courts call them out uh, for having uh, violated the Constitution. Moreover, courts have a, a, a enough of a, a degree of independence in the American context that they're willing uh, to call out presidents um, for constitutional violations. You can imagine circumstances um, in which courts really were the lapdogs of the uh, presidential administration, for example. They didn't have sufficient independence and autonomy um, that they would actually be willing to challenge the administration, in which case you would think this instrument would not be at all effective um, in trying to deal with this particular office and the potential constitutional violations 
um, it might um, incur. Uh, likewise, you might imagine circumstances in which presidents routinely flouted judicial decisions and simply ignored uh, judicial proclamations about instances in which they violated the Constitution. Again, in that case, it would reduce the value of that particular um, tool for remedying constitutional violations. We'd have to look around uh, for others um, that we think might be more effective and impeachment uh, might well be on the table more often as being a more effective mechanism, if not for the fact that judicial review um, has in, in our historical practice um, actually been fairly useful uh, for, in this regard. Um, secondly, uh, we might also think judicial review is more surgical. Um, so one problem with impeachment from the perspective of using it to address constitutional violations um, is that you have to remove the office holder um, entirely if you uh, pursue the impeachment process as a remedy. Um, that might be a perfectly fine um, outcome um, if you think that a particular constitutional violation, one, is particularly grave, um, such that it necessarily means that you really ought to remove the offenders so that they can't engage in these violations um, again in the future, um, or in order to stop the violation that happens to be occurring, uh, perhaps on an ongoing basis um, uh, from that particular officer. Um, but you might also imagine a, a psychological theory about who engages in constitutional violations such that you imagine um, that those who engage in constitutional violations once are likely to repeat the experience um, and that the fact that they've engaged in constitutional violation indicates more generally that they can't be trusted um, to hold public office and exercise uh, these kinds of duties and responsibilities um, of public office. I think in general, this does not describe our psychology about how we think about constitutional violations. Instead, we think about constitutional violations as being much more routine than that. Uh, we think about them as not necessarily reflecting on the char larger character um, of the person or institution that is engaged um, in the constitutional violation. And as a consequence, we might want a more surgical tool that can address the particular problem of that particular violation, remedy that particular violation, but leave in place an officer that you think is otherwise uh, valuable and useful um, uh, to the polity, despite the fact that they have committed um, uh, this particular constitutional violation. And one virtue of judicial review relative to impeachment is it has that surgical capacity um, to resolve the particular constitutional violation rather than uh, going past the violation to address um, issues uh, with the office holder uh, more broadly. So we might think of one difficulty with the impeachment power compared to um, the uh, exercise of review is it's a relatively blunt instrument. And there are many circumstances, it turns out, uh, where we think that uh, blunt instruments are actually not the right way of approaching this problem, but instead we want more surgical um, uh, procedure for getting it. Again, I think this is mostly a contingent feature of our historical development um, and our experience under um, a constitutional system rather than something that's intrinsic to the process itself. Um, uh, certainly some of the founders would have much more easy, readily imagined um, that somebody who engages in constitutional violations once can't be trusted um, to exercise uh, power more generally. They would have thought constitutional violations were something that were extraordinary and especially dangerous um, and reflects very badly on the office holder um, who engages in them. That simply hasn't been the way in which we uh, have tended to think about um, violations given our experience of how a functioning constitutional system actually operates. And as a consequence, um, I think uh, we are more uh, confident in our ability to use a different set of tools uh, for addressing that problem uh, than the impeachment power as such. I think though that same kind of logic and that same kind of calculation that leads us to be thinking about judicial review relative to impeachment in context of constitutional violations also ought to guide us when we're thinking about abuse of office more broadly. Um, that is to say, we ought to be thinking about well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using the impeachment power compared to other kinds of tools that might be available to us to try to remedy uh, the abuse of power um, that we see um, in front of us. It happens, I think, in the context of abuse of power, the judicial review um, often is not going to be a very effective remedy um, uh, for dealing with this. Courts are mostly uh, not going to become involved um, uh, when the claim is that a government official is operating within their lawful authority, they're just misusing their authority um, in one way or another. That kind of discretionary exercise of authority is precisely the kind of thing um, the courts uh, have historically uh, avoided um, intervening on. And so as a consequence, it sort of takes off the table uh, one mechanism that we have found very effective in other contexts, but may not be very effective or useful um, in thinking about the specific problem of abuse of power. And so it may highlight um, the possibility um, that we might want to turn to the impeachment power instead uh, when confronting abuses um, of office. 
But of course, we do have other instruments available, um, even if judicial review is not available in order to deal with abuses of office uh, more, more generally. Um, notably, elections are a classic mechanism that we've used to um, address uh, the possibility that a government official uh, might be abusive. Now, obviously, that doesn't work in the context of uh, federal judges, for example, um, who are certainly impeachable, possible for them to abuse their power, um, but are not accountable um, by an election mechanism. But when we're talking about the President of the United States, um, uh, for example, uh, we might well think that elections um, are perfectly uh, viable um, a remedy for this kind of problem of abuse um, of office. Um, there may be circumstances in which we think elections um, are less effective um, in addressing uh, that problem. And so maybe then it highlights the need for thinking about other tools um, instead, but there are at least gonna be some circumstances uh, where um, abuses um, we might think are precisely the kind of thing that you ought to bring to the electorate and have the electorate resolve uh, through the normal process um, of elections. But for example, we might think that that's less true um, if the next election is very far away. So one reason why the founders wanted to include an impeachment power in the federal constitution in the first place was precisely they're concerned about they're going to establish this very uh, long serving um, but powerful um, uh, government official, the president of the United States with a four year term, extremely long relative to the founders own experience. And from their perspective then, that four years is a long time to wait until the next election if what you wind up with is an officer um, who is um, abusing power over the course of those four years. And so you need it and some kind of mechanism um, that, that can act much more quickly um, in uh, necessary circumstances. Um, that's still true for us um, today. So we might well think that um, elections are perfectly fine as a way of trying to remedy uh, certain kinds of abuses that are occurring relatively close to the election, um, such that Congress ought to hold off on the possibility of using the impeachment power if the voters can get their say uh, soon, we might think very differently if what we think is we're gonna have to live with this office holder for another three years, uh, for example, before the voters are gonna get a chance uh, to weigh in, in which case uh, we might think the turn to Congress becomes uh, much more uh, critical. Um, secondly, we might think of other kinds of institutional reforms or institutional actions that are available to deal with a particular political problem um, that is associated with the abuse of office um, short of turning to uh, the impeachment context. So think of the firing of James Comey by President Trump, uh, for example. So Comey's in the middle of an investigation, uh, an investigation that involves the president himself. Um, the president uh, fires Comey. One immediate concern is uh, this can short circuit the investigation of possible connections between the Trump um, presidential campaign um, and the activities um, of the Russian uh, government more generally. Um, and, that, and, and in that context of that kind of investigation, we might well think that even though firing Comey is completely within the lawful authority of the president, it's an abuse of his office in order to fire Comey under those circumstances. There are contexts in which you might think the impeachment is the immediate step um, one ought to take in order to respond um, to that kind of action. But it's also reasonable to think that there are other institutional steps short of impeachment that could deal with the problem at hand, which is the goal of trying to continue the investigation and come to uh, the truth of the matter about the, re the relationship was between the Trump campaign um, and Russia. So for example, it turns out we could appoint a special um, counsel who could for continue the investigation that Comey um, had started. Um, there are obviously issues about how independent that counsel will be and whether or not the, ind the independent counsel will be um, allowed to complete um, uh, their job um, as well. But the fact is that over the course of the Trump administration, it was possible to turn to this alternative institutional uh, mechanism to basically continue the Comey uh, work means it was also possible then to overlook uh, what might be perceived as an abuse of office and dismissing Comey in the first place. It may heighten the significance of the possibility of, of similarly firing uh, special counsel um, uh, Mueller, for example, um, such that it indicates an even further effort to stonewall investigations, in which case it may heighten the need uh, for use of the impeachment power to address that particular problem. Likewise, we might think of statutes as, and legislation as being one tool for resolving certain kinds of abuses of office. Um, so if we think of Trump's uh, movement of uh, funds um, to uh, supply uh, uh, funds to build the border wall, uh, for example, which Congress doesn't want to build directly, but instead Trump's uh, uh, 
uh, makes this maneuver of declaring a state of emergency that allows him to reroute um, some defense appropriations uh, for this purpose. You might well think this is an abuse of the emergency uh, declaration power and, it's, and moreover a specific abuse of the uh, statutory authority that exists that allows the president to shift funds from the Department of Defense um, to use for this uh, particular um, purpose. But we might think that that a particular kind of abuse of power can be resolved through statute as it'd be possible to tighten the restrictions on how the president can move money around or issue uh, declarations of emergency um, such that we can um, react to and respond to and effectively cabin uh, this particular abuse of office again while leaving the office holder um, in place. That's likewise the calculation that occurs during the Nixon administration in the battle over uh, Nixon's uh, impoundment of funds, for example. We might think that the impoundment um, of, of appropriate funds is an abuse of the president's authority as chief executive um, to make uh, decisions about um, expending funds. Um, and in fact, it might be an abuse of authority that under some context would be impeachable. Um, but we might also think that there are uh, tools available short of impeachment that can help resolve that particular problem um, and developing uh, better budgetary statutes designed to require reporting mechanisms and some accountability between the president and Congress um, over uh, possibilities of impoundment turns out to be the tool that Congress uh, preferred to use under those circumstances that at least um, uh, mitigates the consequences of the abuse, even if it doesn't um, uh, completely um, uh, eliminate it. Um, so let me just uh, end by um, uh, noting broadly that I think when we're thinking about um, the impeachment power, it's a uh, necessary step to identify actions that an office holder has taken um, that fall within the scope of the impeachment power, that they've actually committed something that we can characterize um, as impeachable um, offenses. Um, but there's still an additional question I think that has to be asked after that as to whether or not to choose to use the impeachment power, and that is um, questions about whether or not the impeachment power is actually going to be very effective um, in advancing the larger political goals um, that we have in place, uh, whether or not there are, are alternatives that we think would be equally effective or maybe even more effective um, in solving uh, the problems um, in front of us, and how pervasive and serious do we think the problems um, confronting us um, actually are, um, such that, for example, uh, what we think we need to do is, is necessarily deal with the problem at the level of removing the office holder, or can we adequately uh, deal with the problem um, at the level of responding to the specific abuse um, uh, that um, is confronting us um, at the moment, which requires a calculation and understanding of uh, what the larger strategic objectives are. Um, that Congress is concerned with, what is it they ultimately want to accomplish uh, through the process, uh, which, which then entails uh, some decision making about uh, whether or not impeachment is um, a helpful tool, um, even a, or even an adequate tool um, uh, for advancing uh, those larger objectives or whether there are other things um, that ought to be on the table uh, first or alongside um, any discussion of the impeachment power um, as such. Um, so let me uh, stop there and open it up for uh, questions. Great. Thanks so much, Keith. Uh, looks like Shalev uh, has the first question. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Keith. Uh, and thanks again for joining us. Um, I think this is a really interesting and important project. And I, and I really like the general kind of a political approach. Um, and I'm also very drawn to the idea that the remedy should uh, affect um, when to use the alternative remedies can affect when it's appropriate to use impeachment. I had a question about um, the paper kind of makes an important distinction between abuses of power and excesses of power or usurpation yeah. as you describe them. And it seems like a lot turns on that um, in the paper at least where if it's an excess of power, we might think of the re alternative remedies differently than if it's an abuse of power. And I wanted to kind of push on that distinction um, and also ask whether it's really even if we can distinguish the two, whether the remedies really are different. So um, just briefly on abuse of power versus exceeding power, I think you say that um, both of Trump's impeachments were abuses of power. And I think you could pretty easily categorize the Ukraine impeachment certainly as an excess of power or um, in the idea that the yes, the president has a lot of power of diplomacy to communicate with foreign officials, but he doesn't have power to um, solicit bribes or solicit things that are purely personally interested. And so obviously not everyone agrees that's what was going on. But if you did agree with that, then I think you could easily think of it as an excess of power rather than an abuse of power. 
And then on the second impeachment, I actually wasn't even sure if it's an abuse of power at all, because it's not really that he was using his official power to try to overturn the election. It was more that he was using sort of his political might to do so. Um, and so again, I'm not sure it was an abuse of power, um, but the, the, the more basic question is, can we really distinguish abuse versus excess of power? And then even if we can, are the um, alternative remedies really different? So I think you, in the paper, and you mentioned this today too, um, you suggest that judicial review is not really appropriate for abuses of power, but it can be appropriate for excesses of power. And again, I'm not, I think judicial review can be used for abuses of power. You're right, it's rare, but so is judicial review of excesses of power for the president. But for example, if you think of the census case or the DACA rescission, those are both examples where the executive official clearly had the power to do what they were trying to do. So the Secretary of Commerce had power to put the citizenship question on the census. The Secretary of Homeland Security had the power to rescind DACA. They just didn't do it in the right way. And on the census one in particular, it was a pretext holding. And they said, yes, you would have the power to do this, but you did it in the wrong way. And so I think that's an abuse of power, which still can be judicially reviewed. And then on the other remedies of you know, whether an election, we should wait for the election. I'm just not sure anything turns on it being an abuse or an excess of power. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. I don't think the, uh, a lot necessarily turns on which category um, a particular action belongs in. Um, I think that, um, uh, to my mind, there are a couple of things that are potentially useful in at least sort of highlighting the distinction, trying to think them through. Um, and in part to call attention to the possibility of, well, in part to call attention to how we in fact think about um, uh, constitutional violations in general and its relationship to the impeachment power. Um, that is, we, we, I think, readily accept the idea that judicial review is available in the context of constitutional violations. Um, and, and yet, and, and we just don't think about impeachments in that context. And yet I think it's clear that impeachments could be an available remedy in those contexts, and and that and the constitutional violations surely have to be understood as a kind of impeachable offense. And if we accept that that's true, then we already recognize the fact that we're always making choices about whether or not to use the impeachment power. We already make we already recognize implicitly um, that there are impeachable offenses that you in fact don't then necessarily need to impeach over, such that impeachments are a discretionary choice, um, and which are making decisions about what kind of instrument um, uh, to use under those circumstances. If, if we can get clear on that in the context of violations, then I think it's, it makes it easier to get clear on that in the context of abuses um, as well, which I think is the less familiar kind of set of considerations in the place where there's going to be, where there's more ongoing contestation about um, whether or not abuses even are in the mix of being impeachable offenses. So Dershowitz would want to say you can't even impeach somebody um, over abuses of power. Um, but likewise, it opens that door to saying, well, then it's going to be just impeachment all the time. And I think instead, uh, we want to be saying, look, the same calculation that we're implicitly making in the context of constitutional violations, we should be maybe more explicitly making in the context of abuse of power. And if we can think in those terms, it helps get us out of some of the boxes um, that Dershowitz and others want, want to put us in, um, in, in that regard. Um, but I, but I think you're right that there are lots of uh, things on the boundaries about, well, is this actually count as a violation or is this an abuse? And there's going to be um, uncertainty in some of those cases. In a lot of contexts, the uncertainty doesn't make any difference. And so nothing turns on whether you characterize as one or the other. But one of the places where it might make a difference is, for example, whether you think it's remedi remedi remediable by judicial review. Um, uh, because you think courts mostly have to stay out of it unless it's an instance of an actual violation of the Constitution, um, uh, then you might think, well, uh, if, if it winds up in this abuse of power box, um, uh, then some of the remedies that we might otherwise be looking to are sort of going to be off the table, and that heightens the need to be thinking more carefully about the other uh, remedies that are available to us. Um, there's, a, there's other questions, I think, on the other end of the abuse of power uh, question, which I think is, which are, I think are somewhat difficult ones. And I think the, the Trump's defenders are correct in thinking that it's a sliding scale between what you count as abuse and what is just normal political and policy decisions. And so um, there is this traditional effort to want to say, uh, well, you should not, and I, which I totally agree with, but, but it traces back to the founding itself, where there's an argument that um, uh, look, we don't want to impeach under this federal impeachment power anyway. Uh, 
um, uh, things are simply mere policy disagreements or uh, mere policy errors that uh, a government official might make, um, that those things we shouldn't regard as impeachable offenses in general. And, and there are some gray areas about how you distinguish between those kind of flawed policy decisions, for example, and what actually counts as an abuse of power. Um, and, and those can be tricky on that, on that end as well. And, and, but part of what you might think turns on that question is really, is it even within the scope of the impeachment power um, at, at all? Um, I take your point about the cases like the census case and the DACA case as being um, uh, ways in which courts can get involved in what we might think of as abuse of, of authority as well. Um, and, and I should note that more explicitly in the paper. I do think that there are things you can do with courts to get at this. And the Administrative Procedures Act obviously creates particular opportunities for doing that, which the courts wanted to exploit here. What you, what you can't do is, I guess, simply through constitutional judicial review, effectively get at abusive authority that, that that's not so easily done um, without significantly rethinking what the courts do in general, I think. And so, um, uh, so there are things the courts can do can be helpful. And you may actually think that even those things are actually sufficient in the litigation strategy may be the right first move uh, to make in lots of these contexts. Um, uh, and, and I should note that more explicitly, right? That there are there are ways for courts to be helpful um, in in this context. Thanks, Keith. Our next question comes from Emily Waldman. Hi. Thanks so much for this interesting paper. Um, so I'm at Pace Law School in New York, and in New York right now, this is not at the presidential level, but there is a lot of question about abuse of power and impeachment in the context of our governor. Um, Andrew Cuomo, and I was just interested in your thoughts about where those sorts of allegations fit into thinking about abuses of power and appropriate remedies. And obviously part of what I'm talking about are the sexual harassment allegations, but there's also been a broader discussion about abuse of power that goes beyond sexual harassment in terms of bullying yeah. and things like that, and where that sort of thing fits into your analysis. Yeah, so, um, uh, and it picks up on, on the point just before as well about sort of how to think of some of Trump's offenses and whether or not um, those are properly thought of as abuses of power either. And, and I should just note, I think that for abuse of power is, is one category of impeachable offenses, but it's not the whole scope of where the of impeachable offenses. So, for, so for example, um, uh, uh, Congress's practice manual um, uh, identifies this category that I think is also sort of well accepted by most scholars, um, uh, but they base it on the historical practice of how Congress actually uses the impeachment power of uh, conduct, conduct that is uh, grossly inconsistent with the office that you hold. Um, so, so we might imagine this gets examples like, well, what if the president actually goes out and shoots somebody on Fifth Avenue? It's not abuse of power, um, but presumably we actually do want to remove a president who is um, out there shooting people on Fifth Avenue um, uh, for engaging in behavior that's grossly incompatible with the office, even though it's it's in some sense purely private behavior, um, uh, right? Um, uh, and and unfortunately, we have we have examples that actually are more realistic examples. Uh, and unfortunately, Trump didn't actually test how far he could go in shooting people uh, on Fifth Avenue. But this kind of example from Cuomo is is one of these examples, right? Where it's where we might think of as a kind of private behavior. Um, uh, although in this case, it's private behavior that occurs in the office in the workplace, and so um, uh, certainly more on his border, but not one that involves his his exercise of office as as such. It's a function of his authority as governor that that creates the the concern. Um, so we might think that abuse of office is in the right category, but it sort of falls within the scope of what we traditionally think of as impeachable offenses. Um, although. Notably, the New York Constitution is written differently than the federal constitution about um, the impeachment power, and it's much murkier <laughs> about what counts as impeachable offenses uh, than the US Constitution even is uh, in, in this context. I do think, though, there's similar questions to be raised when you think about these kinds of um, offenses that Cuomo is being accused of, of um, uh, what is the what is what do you imagine if you're a legislator thinking about whether or not to use the impeachment power in this context, for example, you, you have to think about what is the ultimate end goal and what you need to accomplish in order to solve this particular political problem. Um, and are there other remedies potentially available um, to you? Obviously, encouraging him to resign is a potential remedy. 
um, in that sense. So if you can put pressure on a governor um, to actually resign from the office, then you accomplish the whole thing. You don't necessarily have to impeach um, in order uh, to do that. But in part because it does not involve um, use, of, use of power one way or another, but instead is a function of personal behavior, you can imagine it's actually much tougher to imagine how would you design some kind of appropriate political remedy for that kind of problem, right? They, these are, this is a kind of problem that goes directly to the nature of the office holder himself, such that you might think that this is gonna be recurrent, there's no way of controlling it, and as a consequence, the only correct solution is to remove that office holder rather than try to somehow cabin the behavior, right? So you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine thinking, well, what we need is some kind of Mike Pence rule where Cuomo is not allowed to be uh, in private with uh, with any uh, female aides or something. But presumably, we think that's a really lousy solution to dealing with this problem. And so we might think, like, the only actual solution that we think could actually be effective and would accomplish the goals we're trying to accomplish here, which includes condemning this kind of behavior, but also preventing him from continuing to engage in this particular behavior, is we need to actually remove him. Um, that, that, and, and that's going to be more true of some kind of behavior than it's going to be true of other kind of behavior. I do think this is exactly the kind of behavior that suggests that that's the right remedy um, and that anything short of that um, doesn't actually uh, solve the problem that you're confronted with. Um, uh, and, and it's in some ways you might think that the impeachment is, is tailor-made uh, for dealing with problems of that sort. Notably, I should just add to this, I mean, the wrinkle that I mentioned uh, when in, in my opening comments as well, that depending on your psychology of who abuses power or violates constitutional authority, you could easily come to the exact same conclusion on the basis of some kind of abuse of official power. And that is to say, part of the calculation here with somebody like Cuomo, for example, is you might think this guy is just going to be a serial abuser of women. He's, he's going to continue to engage in bad behavior if you leave him uh, in place, uh, because this is reflective of underlying features of his personality and character um, uh, that can't be easily controlled um, or contained. And so this is going to be an ongoing problem as long as this person continues to occupy the kind of office he occupies. You can easily imagine a political psychology of constitutional violations that comes to the same conclusion based on somebody violating their constitutional authority or abusing their constitutional authority, then if you see an instance of a government official abusing their constitutional authority, you might well conclude this is the kind of person who just can't be trusted to continue to hold power. And it's not enough to solve this particular abuse or try to limit it to cabinet. We got to remove the entire office holder because this is just going to recur in some fashion. What's notable is that's not generally the political psychology we currently tend to, to use when we think about constitutional abuse. Um, but it is the kind of political psychology I think we continue to use when we think about these kind of personal uh, misdeeds of, of this type of um, harassing women, for example. So, um, so it does sort of depend on what your underlying theory is about what's causing the bad behavior that, that forces you to think about, um, well, okay, is the way to solve the bad behavior and prevent it from recurring is you got to go after the office holder themselves, um, or is it possible um, to be a step removed from the office holder, be in some sense more surgical, and focus on the particular abuse and behavior and, and try to address that directly rather than direct uh, address what we might think of as the underlying problem, uh, which is the, the abuse of office holder. Next, uh, we have a question from Mark Graeber. Uh, first, thank you for the paper. Um, a sort of what I call comment question and a real question. The, the comment question goes off of Shalav and whether as American law increases balancing tests at the expense of bright lines that an abuse and a usurpation are going to collapse since by definition in a balancing test, if you have an abuse, it's a, it's a usurpation. The serious question, um, is at one point in the paper you say, well, if Trump had behaved like this as a businessman, that would have been okay, maybe. And I know for you know 30 years, you've done just a terrific job on constitutional ethics. But I'm wondering, it's a sort of a classic conservative question. Can you have a regime in with people outside of politics may take advantage of every legal loophole, engage in Trump-like behavior, but in fact be expected when they come into the sphere to adopt an entirely different ethos. 
uh, yeah, no, I think it's a problem. Um, uh, it's one reason why I thought Trump was unfit for office um, uh, in 2016. Um, uh, precisely out of those kind of concerns, right? I mean, it's it's both. I think so. One way of thinking about that, right, is thinking of it as a question about um, uh, uh, sort of a kind of socialization in a set of private institutions that is not going to translate well to um, a public office holding context. Um, so if you have spent your entire career uh, in which you think about the law as a uh, tool uh, by which you can advance your private interest um, and as something that you ought to be trying to figure out how do you cut the corners on as often as possible. Um, likewise, in order to advance your private interest, which we might think of as a perfectly reasonable um, attitude to take when you're thinking about the law, if, if your job is as a real estate developer, um, that, that the lifetime of thinking in those terms uh, is not going to uh, make you well suited uh, for transitioning to a context of public office holding where now your responsibility is um, to uphold the law and advance the norms of the law uh, for the sake of the public interest uh, more, more generally. I do think that part of what we saw with Trump um, is uh, this is what happens when you put a real estate developer um, in, in the presidency, um, that there's a, a sharp mental transition that has to take place and Trump seems not to have been able uh, to make that transition. You can imagine other people doing it um, uh, more effectively than he did, but it's but it's a risk you take um, when you take somebody from a completely different sphere of operation um, and put them into uh, this kind of uh, public um, uh, context. So that, I think there's just a that's just sort of a risk of thinking about the fact that we have very different spheres of life in which the attitude toward the law and its relationship to self interest is very different, and we expect something different from public office holders, and we expect from people in other uh, parts of the society and the economy. And there's there's going to be some difficulties uh, when you take one somebody out of one zone and put them into a, a different one. You might think though there's also more particular problems of of the particular personality of this individual, right? So laying aside the question of what did he spend his career doing? What was he socialized in? We might just think this particular individual um, uh, has a particular set of attitudes um, uh, that are pretty hardwired and hard to break. And I do think then uh, that part of what uh, you want to be thinking about is how do you keep those individuals from occupying um, high office in general? And then what do you do when, when they happen to wind up um, occupying that kind of office? I do think in the case of Trump, part of what you're confronting is um, somebody who uh, uh, was going to be constantly pushing the boundaries of acceptable behavior for a president. As a consequence, uh, you find yourself, if you're um, a, a congressman, um, confronted uh, with a whole range of impeachable offenses. And, and really the, tr the question is, well, which ones do you want to pursue? Uh, that's more the question than the question of, are there any impeachable offenses uh, that uh, could be uh, pursued? Um, and I think certainly when you find yourself in that situation, um, uh, it, it ought to make you think that the problem here is not just the, an individual one-off um, abuse of office or violation of office. The problem here is the individual occupying the office. Um, in which case, maybe the proper response to that is to focus directly on that individual and actually remove them um, so that they cannot continue to, to cause these problems uh, for the rest of their um, of rest of their term. I mean, I, part of the challenge for the impeachment power more generally, though, is in our democratic age, I think that's a very hard call for congressmen to make, right? That, that's just not something that our modern Congress is very comfortable in thinking about or our modern political culture is very comfortable uh, with the idea of Congress uh, quickly second guessing the underlying fitness of a uh, president, for example, to hold public office after the voters have put them um, in place. And one feature of the Trump experience is I think it's just highlighted the uh, inadequacy of impeachment um, as an effective tool uh, for dealing with uh, problematic presidents. Next in the queue, we have a lot of warm in, but I'm going to jump in here myself because my question is a direct follow up to what you just uh, said now, Keith. Um, when you compare impeachment to the various alternatives uh, in the paper, um, uh, you're really comparing uh, removal uh, of a president from office uh, to the various steps short of removal that might be taken for dealing with particular issues. But as you just noted now, um, under present political conditions, 
uh, impeachment is exceedingly unlikely. It seems almost unimaginable, in fact, uh, that uh, it's going to result in removal of a president from office. And I'm wondering how this changes yeah. the calculus. If you think of uh, the alternative impeachment as really failed impeachment and whatever you might accomplish or not accomplish, whatever the costs and benefits of that might be compared to the alternatives, uh, how much does that change the way uh, a constitutionally conscientious congressperson might think about this question? Yeah, so, um, so one is I, I, I still want to uh, uh, resist uh, where we are and thinking about how uh, useful impeachments are. And so, so I feel some need to continue sort of pressing the idea that impeachment is actually important. We ought to think about it seriously, um, even while recognizing that I think uh, as a political matter, um, it's, it's hard to imagine it being used. And I think in part of the Trump presidency um, hi highlights that. Um, uh, but, you know, but, but not completely off the table and not only, in, I think in the presidential context, you can imagine circumstances in which it's still on the table. But, but the other thing that I found frustrating during this Trump episode is the extent to which when we talk about the impeachment power relative to Trump, uh, we tend to ignore the fact that it, the impeachment power includes more than just the president, includes lots of other offices as well. And we actually do want to maintain this power um, as a vehicle for addressing these other offices. Um, and in fact, most of our impeachment experience at the federal level has involved other offices, primarily lower court judges. And so um, uh, one of my frustrations, for example, with Dershowitz's standard for what he counts as impeachable offenses is if you take that seriously, not only does it have consequences whether or not you can impeach Trump, it has dramatic consequences about your ability to impeach all kinds of trial judges um, that we have historically impeached um, uh, and removed uh, from office under those circumstances. So it makes them, so you don't want to pervert the impeachment power um, because we're so focused on the particular problem of the presidency and we ignore um, the wider set of potential um, uh, uses. But so, so for saying that aside, I think there is, I think you're totally right though to think that if you are, uh, that maybe impeachments are effectively off the table um, um, uh, at the presidential level, although frankly, if Cuomo gets impeached and removed at the at the state level, um, it raises interesting questions about whether or not that's really true about the nature of our political culture more generally and how parties work um, uh, broadly. Um, uh, that if it's manageable at the state level, um, it is presumably imaginable at the federal level um, as as well. Um, so I have a lot of interest in how the uh, how the Cuomo uh, thing winds up playing playing out. Um, but I think it's also the case that the part of what I would want to encourage uh, constitutionally conscientious legislators to be thinking about um, is to not simply think about this whole question about impeachable offenses in strictly legalistic terms, um, such that um, uh, if you think there are impeachable offenses, then, then that necessarily means you ought to be impeaching. And so either if you think impeachment's off the table, then you just have to stop thinking about impeachable offenses entirely, and which effectively winds up downgrading the significance of what you're looking at. Um, I think instead legislators ought to be recognizing the fact of we have some grave constitutional abuses in front of us. Those things could easily qualify as high crimes and misdemeanors. They might well justify an impeachment. But impeachments aren't the only way of trying to deal with that problem. We ought to be thinking as well about what other problems we ought to deal with. But recognizing their significance precisely by recognizing their relationship to what this classic impeachment power was set up to do in the first place. And so one thing I do worry about is if not only do you wind up taking the impeachment power off the table as a political tool, um, uh, such that people just sort of understand, well, of course, we can't actually do that. But you wind up sort of downgrading the significance, constitutionally speaking, of potential kinds of actions that we might see office holders taking um, that that um, uh, can, I think, reduce the energy of, of the kind of response, even if the response might be a, a something other than impeachment. Um, so, so I hope that legislators continue thinking about impeachable offenses. Um, they just have a better appreciation that even if you don't think impeachment is going to be the thing you do to follow up on those impeachable offenses, um, that you recognize the significance of the impeachable offenses and why we ought to regard those as particularly disturbing, and then trying to take the uh, political steps that are available to you uh, to address them. Thank you. Next question is from Elon Worman. Hey, I'm Elon from uh, Arizona State, not hey. Arizona Law. Uh, good to see you, Keith. Um, there's a lot more going on right outside my window, so sorry about that. Uh, 
So I kind of want to, in response to Shalev's question to you, actually maybe defend your initial distinction even more vigorously than you did. I, I would not let this distinction go because I think too much during the Trump administration, we saw the type of constitutional argument, which was, oh, this is really bad. Therefore, it must not be within his power to do it or it must not be constitutional. And that's just a weird way in my view, in my mind to interpret, uh, to, to do constitutional interpretation. Maybe the president can pardon himself. Maybe he can't. I don't know, but it strikes me as a bad argument to say that the, whether the power exists depends on whether we think it would be a good or bad thing if Trump exercised it. And I think a classic example of your distinction was made by Madison in the case of removals in the first removal debate where he said something very interesting. He said, the wanton removal of meritorious officers would make the president liable himself to impeachment. I thought that was just great because he was arguing the president has the constitutional power to remove officers. That's what he was arguing for. Today, people might dispute that, but if Madison was correct, he still said, nevertheless, he would be liable to an impeachment for an abuse uh, of that power. And so that's kind of a nice example that I immediately thought of when with the, the Comey uh, situation. And, you know, I don't know that if this question is more for, Shalev, I'll try to make it a question for you rather than Shalev, but I wonder if there is a difference between abuse of discretion in administrative law and abuse of power. I mean, it strikes me that what yeah. you're pointing to, Keith, is yeah. kinds of cases that are more committed to agency discretion by law, right? That's what's so confusing about administrative law. What is the relationship between 706 and 702? Discretion can be reviewable under one, but not the other. Well, committed to agency discretion by law is certain kinds of discretion that historically were unreviewable because there's no law to apply or because it's a political question or what have you. And those are the kinds of things that it seems to me maybe would be subject to the impeachment power. And so maybe the way to get around of Shalev's criticism or, or, or point is to just reframe it slightly to say, impeachment makes sense where judicial review isn't available. Judicial review usually won't be available when we're dealing with abuse of power versus excess of power, but there's gonna be exceptions to both. I don't know, maybe a slight reframing would help. So question mark there at the end. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I would, I would actually, um, uh... Emphasize again, though, that I think even when judicial review is available, you might still think that impeachment ought to uh, be the appropriate response. Um, uh, so you might think, for example, that a constitutional violation, and I apologize, there's a leaf blur outside my window, so I don't know if that's being picked up on the mic or not, but um, I know my own instinct is to talk louder than in response to the leaf blur. Um, but the, um, uh, but the, uh, but, but, but certainly I think there are, circumstances where you might think that the constitutional violation is uh, so uh, severe um, that, um, and, and so severe for the larger political culture, for example, um, that removal of the officer is the appropriate solution, even if courts would be willing to uh, strike that particular action uh, down. Um, uh, so, I mean, in some ways, you can imagine if the violations are sufficiently egregious, you'd be very nervous about whether or not just review would actually be an effective remedy anyway. Um, but imagine the president who just started locking up his political opponents um, or, or announced that we're canceling the elections, we're not having them, right? And, and then uh, somebody ran off and filed a lawsuit and judges all quickly declare, uh, no, you have to let all those pr political prisoners go and we're really going to have elections after all. Undoubtedly, you'd be nervous that that mechanism of having courts make those declarations wouldn't actually be very effective under those circumstances. A president willing to say we're not having elections might not might also not be willing to back off um, if courts tell you that's unconstitutional. Um, but we might think that even if the president is willing to back off when a court tells them unconstitutional, it's still the case you wouldn't want to leave that person in office. Um, that somebody that's willing to engage in that behavior is somebody that you wouldn't want to trust um, uh, to leave in place. And moreover, you want to send the strong, strongest possible signal to any future political office holder um, that they too should never do this thing. Um, and so impeachment might be an effective mechanism uh, for doing that. So there may be circumstances where even if you think judicial review is, is uh, available and maybe even reasonably effective, um, it's still the case that you might want to impeach because there are other things you want to accomplish um, that you don't think judicial review by itself would really accomplish. Um, and I'm totally with you on this question about abuse of power and, um, and exceeding power and, and where the lines are drawn. I was very frustrated with a lot of the discourse surrounding the Trump administration in particular, although we've seen it in other contexts as well. But it was very prominent in the Trump uh, context of uh, people concluding that 
uh, this thing that, tr that President Trump might do is, is bad, therefore it's outside the scope of his lawful authority. Um, uh, I just think it led to a lot of bad constitutional analysis. There's all kinds of things that are within the constitutional authority of the president that nonetheless can be uh, uh, misused in various ways. Um, and we need to try to preserve a language where we can talk about the fact um, that sometimes people have power and yet they abuse it. Um, and abuse is bad. Um, it's possible to criticize it. It's possible to respond to it um, in, in various ways, including, I think, through the impeachment power. Um, and that we don't necessarily need to translate all abuses uh, into being some kind of constitutional violation um, in order to think they're serious and, and addressable. Um, and moreover, to the extent that we make that move, um, we may also find ourselves tying the hands of future office holders who need that lawful authority in order to make decisions we think are perfectly good ones. Um, and yet, because we were unhappy with how some particular office holder used that authority, uh, we wound up effectively shrinking the authority as a whole. Um, so, so I think maintaining a category of abuse of office is a very important thing to do within a constitutional system, um, even though there's going to be gray areas and murkiness and some uh, 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 difficulty in line drawing um, on, on the borders um, uh, around it. Um, and, and so I think it's important that we recognize it. I think it's important that as constitutional theorists, we talk about it. Um, and I think in part, it's important to talk about it in the context of the impeachment power and what the impeachment power is for. Next question is from Robert Goldstein. Hi, uh, from UCLA. Uh, a comment, Chada, I think restricted possibilities for congressional checking and left a lot of emergency delegations on the books that make presidential uh, action lawful but abusive. So it's the, the court has has created some of the, the the problem. What I want to ask about is the practice of ostracism. Mm -hmm. Does it this is sort of one of democracy's earliest techniques. And it it's it does suggest uh, that um, that, that there is this category of threat to the republic or threat to the democracy, uh, where somebody for a variety of reasons may just be a threat and undermine the capacity of, the, of, of a republic to function. Um, I, think, I think there's one place in the Federalist Papers where the word ostracism is used, uh, in this context, but they don't, they don't seem to refer to it. And, and I don't know beyond that, whether it was um, discussed as a uh, practice of democracy. Yeah, so um, uh, on your first point about China, I think that's absolutely right, right? And although I have to admit, I've become um, uh, more skeptical about the wisdom of China over time. Um, and uh, in part with these kinds of issues in mind, I think it, it I'm not fundamentally very confident that let's say vetoes were that effective anyway, but but um, but you have effectively taken one tool out of the toolbox that Congress might otherwise use to to restrict legislative uh, executive discretion in some of these um, contexts, um, and it makes it more complicated to figure out how do you accomplish the kind of delegations Congress continues to want to accomplish while um, dealing with this abuse of power problem. Um, and we see it all over the place, right? You can, and, and you can think about the border wall as just being just one example of that, right? Where um, uh, on the one hand, there's a perfectly uh, good reason why Congress in fact wants to have, the wants to allow the president the discretionary authority to quickly move funds around um, uh, to deal with the national defense and the context of gender and emergencies. Um, but, but it's very hard to write that um, delegation of authority without also allowing for the possibility of these kinds of abuses. Um, you can imagine courts getting much tougher about how it interprets the underlying statute. I think they actually should have been um, in the context of the border wall, and so um, uh, which which would empower Congress some degree to be able to write into statutes some more specificity about how you uh, uh, under what circumstances and for what purposes you can move money, um, and not just give the president a blank check. Um, but it is a it is a complication, and, and China makes it more complicated. Um, the ostracism point I think is an interesting one. I I is one of it is one of the ways in which I talked about the the potential importance of the second Trump impeachment, in particular in the in the concern of potentially disqualifying him from future office. Um, is that um, there is a well recognized um, 
idea that some people are just dangerous to democracies um, and that you uh, want to remove those people and from the possibility of holding office. And um, uh, that may not be the case that you can exile them and, and literally throw them out of the country uh, in the modern American context, but you might well be able to take them off the ballot uh, for purposes of voters continue to put these people forward. I also thought, though, that this this more general problem about democracies and the and the problem of what ostracism is designed to deal to solve and deal with um, did always highlight the danger of Donald Trump too, though. Um, uh, even early in his presidency, when people first started talking, including me, uh, first started talking about the impeachment power in this context, because one thing that seemed quite apparent about Donald Trump is he was not going to go quietly, um, and so um, one political challenge you have to think through if you're a legislator thinking about whether or not to impeach somebody like Trump is, um, will that actually make the problem worse um, if you try to remove him from office um, and then leave him out there on the hustings uh, telling everybody uh, what an illegitimate Congress it is that uh, illegitimately removed me from power and stole my presidency. Um, you know, with Richard Nixon, one virtue of Richard Nixon, you did, you know, Nixon may not have had lots of virtues, but among his virtues uh, is he actually resigned quietly and went off and wrote policy books in order to recover his reputation uh, and, and gain respectability, right? That was never going to be Trump's path. And, and so as a consequence, if you're a legislator thinking seriously about what do we do about this person who we think is abusing power, you have to take into account, are we facing a Richard Nixon or are we facing a Donald Trump and what will the most presidential version of this person be? Um, and, and that has to be part of the calculation, I think, about how you try to deal with that person. Um, and, and when you're faced with somebody like Trump, I think that's just a really serious, difficult problem. Like I said, it's the underlying problem that ostracism was designed to deal with as well and that they wanted to talk about. And I think the fact that we don't have ostracism on the table uh, as an available remedy uh, shouldn't blind us to the fact that we nonetheless may confront similar problems uh, in, in operating a democracy. We have to think about those problems very seriously. Um, even if we don't have that particular remedy available to us as a way of trying to address them. Uh, not that I'm necessarily encouraging options, I'm not sure they'd be very effective anyway, but it's a, but yeah, but, it, but I think it does highlight, uh, there is a real problem that that, that was, was concerned with and, um, and it was easy for us in some ways as Americans to sort of forget that's a problem. And I think one thing that Trump ought to have reminded us of um, is, is that larger kind of uh, issue of uh, populist uh, political figures uh, who can be uh, dangerous to the underlying principles of the political system. Uh, the last person currently uh, in the queue is Jonathan Schaub, uh, and we have about 12 minutes left for questions. Hey, uh, thanks for the paper. It was uh, It's excellent and uh, thought-provoking. So my question, it, it kind of is a current under uh, the discussion of abuse of power is the question of intent, right? And sort of whose interest is being furthered. Um, and I just, you can even thinking through some of the things we've talked about, the firing or the use of a holding, holding money back. And, and I come at it a lot of times from the privilege perspective and the oversight and actions that aren't really sort of stretches of power. It's not Trump taking a broad view of authority in, in that sense of abuse, but it's using could be well-established authority for sort of personal motives that we think are improper, which yeah. is the motive for impeachment. And I just wonder sort of what role you think that should play. And as you, in sort of distinguishing between an abuse of power versus uh, an excess or uh, a usurpation. And then at the same time, it seems like courts aren't that ill-equipped to sort of look into intent, right? We saw with the Trump impeachments, Congress seems very ill-equipped to investigate motives because they, they can't get any evidence um, and they don't have witnesses and they don't do that kind of thing. So if you're thinking about the courts acting in this, in to check or to see if the president's following the statutory directive, you might think they actually could perform the role of figuring out what the underlying motive was, or at least fact finding sort of what was going on. Yeah, well, that just reflects that Congress is broken, right? I mean, it's not that Congress institutionally doesn't have the authority to do that or is incapable of doing that. It's like this Congress doesn't choose to do it that way. Um, the, the impeachments ought to be fact-finding uh, uh, episodes. They ought to be uh, mechanisms for figuring out what's happening inside the executive branch and putting it 
uh, in the light of day and, and if necessary, criticizing, condemning, uh, and removing officers for having engaged in it. Um, and so it's just the pathetic quality of our current Congress that we don't actually get an impeachment that does what the impeachment power is supposed to be doing. Uh, and so instead, we're, we're using makeshift institutions and say, well, maybe we could use something like the courts uh, to do the impeachment thing for us. Um, you know, if that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. Uh, but it's but it's disappointing uh, that 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 uh, that's the pathetic state of things that we have fallen into. I think, uh, and, so, and part of my interest in the impeachment power is encouraging Congress to think more seriously about what the stupid power is actually for. Uh, so maybe they'll actually uh, use it uh, more appropriately. Um, uh, but I'm not necessarily optimistic uh, about about that happening. Um, so. It is so. This so it is. I think a fascinating question, which I have to admit, I do not feel like I have a very good handle on about about sort of as I know this sort of the other end of this boundary is not. It's so the one end of the boundary might think about the where's the line between abuse of power and and violations of authority um, or exceeding uh, your lawful authority. And on the other end is what's the difference between abuse of power and just exercising your uh, lawful discretion uh, and and and. What's, where, what's the thing that we think of as normal politics where you can criticize somebody for making bad policy decisions or whatever, um, or incompetence, um, uh, for example, um, and things that we actually characterize as abuse of office. Um, I don't think that's a very easy line to uh, draw either. Um, uh, I've been spending some time thinking about, and I actually still don't have a very good sense about, I think, how to draw that line. The one that you point to is, is one obvious place to go. I just don't want to limit it to that, I think. Um, but but one place to point to, and, and traditionally we have when we talk about abuse of authority, um, is one thing that we think people can, one way in which people can abuse authority, one reason why they can abuse authority is because they use their uh, lawful authority um, to advance their own personal self-interest. Um, and so if we can identify that that's what's happening, um, uh, then we might think, uh, well, that, count, that surely counts as abuse because you're not authorized to use your authority for your own personal interest. You're, you're authorized to use it, you're given it uh, in order to advance the public interest. So, you know, you, one of the, yeah, and that can be hard to figure out in practice, right, as to how we distinguish between these things, especially depending on how broadly we, we think about people's private interest in this regard. Um, so one of the fascinating features of the first Trump impeachment associated with the Ukraine stuff um, was, uh, is he acting out of uh, bad purposes or not? Um, in the context of, of this uh, kind of phone call and what would we have to know in order to make that distinction and be able to say um, he, he acted out of, of bad uh, motives. Um, and one kind of move that you saw um, some of the witnesses constructing more than actually the legislators themselves constructing, I think, um, is, um, is a claim that there is uh, no credible public serving rationale uh, for this behavior. Um, that there is no uh, identifiable American national interest that could possibly uh, be advanced uh, by the content of this phone call. And if so, you, if you can rule everything else out, <laughs> then the only thing left uh, must be his own uh, personal uh, self-interest, um, which I think is, is uh, at least one way of trying to get at the problem um, and is helpful in some context, um, uh, probably a lot less helpful in other contexts, may actually work in the context of the Ukraine phone call, for example, um, or the Georgia Secretary of State phone call, uh, for example. But there are sort of difficult contexts of thinking about, sort of, for example, what counts as um, as personal self-interest in this regard. Um, uh, so, for example, imagine um, uh, that somebody recorded uh, Jimmy Carter's Oval Office conversations with his aides um, over the course of the Iran hostage crisis. Um, and at some point during that crisis, somebody says, you're never gonna win re-election if we don't get these people out. Um, and so it's gonna be critical to our re-election efforts um, uh, to do something about the Iranian hostages. Is it therefore illegitimate for you to, to deal with the Iranian hostages if you think that the present fact is primarily motivated by the fact he wants to get re-elected? Um, and that's part of what Trump's argument is in some of these other contexts as well, that, that the, the self-interest at stake is a re-election self-interest. And we might think in general that's a legitimate um, interest. Um, and so again, it sort of has this sort of murky quality. And so it's relatively easy if what we're talking about is, is somebody's putting money in your pocket, um, uh, so you're corrupt in sort of this very classic uh, kind of way. Those are relatively easy to sort of hive off and say, well, that's just purely self-interest. There's no public regarding reason for doing that. 
some of these other things I think are actually much trickier where where politicians genuinely have mixed motives as to what they're trying to do. Um, they, they are doing things in part because it's it's in their interest to do it, uh, and in part because it's also in the nation's interest. And as Madison would have said, that's precisely what you want your political system to be doing, is to align these interests so that the personal is serving the national. Um, and so that simply the identification of a personal interest shouldn't be sufficient to think, okay, well now it counts as abuse. But that does make it tricky then to how to disentangle these things and may shrink the category of what we count as abuse, I think way too much um, if we're sort of limited um, to that, uh, to identifying that kind of situation. Um, the other kind of problem though, or you know, a, a another category of abuse um, is we might is, is more substantive though, and does require substantive judgment. So we might say that that things are abuse of your discretion if they're being used for the wrong purposes, not in the sense of they're used for purposes of advancing your self-interest. They're being used for the wrong kind of political purposes. Um, so um, uh, well, well, I don't know. So 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 a lot of the examples that come easily to mind sort of uh, uh, run into other constitutional constraints that we might or, or legal constraints we might think about. Um, as as well, um, but 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 you might imagine there's a whole set of things where where um, uh, a politician uh, or a government official exercising um, authority is making uh, discretionary decisions that are within his discretionary authority, um, but they are advancing a set of political ends that you think are fundamentally subversive of the nature of the American constitutional order as we understand it um, and would like it to proceed in the future. I think not unreasonable to count that as a kind of abuse of office. It's we're exercising lawful authority. It's exercising lawful authority on behalf of a certain kind of political project. Um, but it's a political project you think is is uh, fundamentally ought to be contempt. Um, that's does require political judgment. It requires making contestable, highly contestable political judgments that some uh, kinds of projects, political projects are off the table and shouldn't be advanced. Um, and that you are impeachable if you attempt to um, advance uh, those kinds of projects. Um, but I think is within the bounds of what you might think of as abuse of power. Likewise, with abuse of power to take the national emergency and border wall kind of context, you might think that it's sort of, uh, um, uh, it's that the uh, taking of a uh, lawful authority, in this case, for example, that you have through statute that is given to you for particular kind of purposes and you, and you turn it to completely unrelated purposes, that that too is a kind of abuse of office. The problem is we see presidents do that all the time, and so we probably don't want to go there. Um, and it's tricky to um, uh, separate out the two. Um, but so, for example, take the border wall thing, though, right? So if you look at the, stat the underlying statute, um, that, uh, that allows the president to move funds for building projects within uh, defense appropriations. It is extremely clear that what Congress is trying to do is authorize the president to build national fortifications um, uh, using uh, other construction uh, monies that have been appropriated within the Defense Department in the context of some national security threat. Uh, nothing like that looks like the so-called border crisis right and the effort to keep um uh people from crossing uh the border in that particular case right so it's 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 a uh a bending of the existing statutory authority to such a point that we might think it's breaking it and certainly is using it for um uh, purposes that are um uh, quite dramatically at odds with the purposes for which you were given the power in the first instance um uh, at some point, we might think that that's not just a, uh, a misinterpretation of the statute, but it's actually an abuse of, of the discretionary authority um, that you've been given. But again, I think those are going to be highly contestable judgments, um, uh, difficult to make on particular purposes, and moreover, it's the kind of thing we accept in all kinds of uh, occasions. It's one reason, though, why I think the impeachment power is also trusted to Congress, um, that that. Uh, it is partly true that precisely because it is a political judgment about is this kind of way in which you're using your lawful discretionary authority um, uh, subversive of the reasons why you're given this authority in the first place, um, so egregious um, that it would justify this kind of public con condemnation and potentially uh, the end of your uh, term of office, that is fundamentally a political judgment for which legislators are ultimately electorally accountable. They make that judgment in a way that their voters don't agree with. Um, and I think in part the impeachment power is a, is a power that's available to make those kind of uh, decisions. Um, 
but again, there's no bright line here. Um, once you're starting to think about those kinds of cases, and, and you might think, in fact, it's a mistake to even be thinking about those kind of cases that, that now we really are um, outside the realm of what ought to be counted as abuse of power and simply within the realm of political, normal political disagreements. Um, uh, but I think there are cases in that mode. I need to think more about how to sort of think about them and identify them and how we ought to think about abuse, what, what we mean when we say abuse of power uh, uh, generally. Um, but I do think there's an interesting sort of intimate relationship between the fact that these are contestable but very political judgments um, and that the tool that's constitutionally entrusted to Congress, uh, the, the tool we have, constitutionally speaking, for addressing those um, is an impeachment power that's entrusted to an elected legislature uh, to make those calls. And an elected legislature in which in order to actually um, uh, convict uh, requires a very large majority. Uh, a, a very a very large amount of agreement um, in the in the Senate in order to um, uh, actually convict. Um, uh, I think also suggests sort of interesting things about um, uh, how we ought to think about abuse of power and how it fits within the constitutional scheme and what our tools are uh, for um, for addressing them within the contours of our constitutional system. Thanks, Keith. That brings us to the end of our time for today. Uh, the next event in our series uh, will take place on April 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern time when we'll hear from uh, Maggie Blackhawk. Uh, for now, please join me uh, in thanking Keith for this very stimulating uh, conversation. Uh, and thanks to all of you uh, for coming. We'll hope to see you next time. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.